Welcome to the complete story of Final Fantasy VI. The game many believe to be the gold standard for all Final Fantasy games, despite its age and graphical simplicity. As a tale of diverse heroes and a world on the brink of ruin, the game's story is anything but simple, weaving an intricate tapestry that explores loss in a myriad of forms, and perseverance in the face of overwhelming adversity. Oh, and also there's an opera. But anyway, I'm Peter from Birds of Play, and in this video, I hope you'll join me as we revisit the complete story of the one and only Final Fantasy VI, a game for the history books, and now also a game for the storybooks. It's a long way from here to the end of the world, but I hope you'll be with us every step of the way. The Ancient War of the Magi When its flames last receded, only the charred husk of a world remained. Even the power of magic was lost. In the thousand years that followed, iron, gunpowder and steam engines took the place of magic, and life slowly returned to the barren land. Yet there now stands one who would reawaken the magic of ages past, and use its dread power as a means by which to conquer all the world. Could anyone truly be foolish enough to repeat that mistake? Near the town of Nasha, two imperial soldiers, Biggs and Wedge, accompanied by a young woman, ride atop their Magitek armor through the snow. Their mission being to retrieve a recently discovered Esper from a mine shaft near the settlement. However, the woman who wields powerful magic is not there of her own free will. Her mind being controlled to serve the Empire by a slave crown placed upon her head. The residents of Nasha do their best to resist the Empire's raid, but all is for naught as the invaders force their way to the Esper, encased within a block of ice. Suddenly, the frozen creature begins emitting an eerie light, its magic killing Biggs and Wedge, and rendering the young woman unconscious. As she wakes up, she is greeted by Arvis, who explains that he has removed her slave crown, effectively freeing her from her enthrallment. Having regained her senses, the woman nevertheless seems to suffer from amnesia, remembering nothing of her past except that her name is Terra. All of a sudden, the Nasha guards arrive to take Terra into custody, but Arvis sneaks her out the back where she can escape through the mines. Ultimately, the guards corner her, making her plummet down a shaft into another area of the mines. As she falls unconscious from the fall, Terra is treated to a memory of the man who placed the slave crown upon her head. The man's name is Kefka Palazzo, the court mage of the Gestalian Empire, who then ordered her to slaughter imperial soldiers as a test of her magical powers. She then remembers Emperor Gestal, the ruler of the Gestalian Empire, offering up a rousing speech to his soldiers about how the might of magic will give them the power to rule the world. Back at Arvis' house, a young treasure hunter and trail-worn traveler named Locke arrives on the scene. Arvis asks Locke to get Terra safely away from Nasha and escort her to the kingdom of Figaro in the hope of one day freeing Nasha from the clutches of the Empire, her powers possibly proving useful to the Returners, a group of insurgents who oppose the Empire. After escaping from the cave through a secret exit, Terra and Locke make their way south to Figaro, where they gain an audience with Edgar, Figaro's flirtatious king, who promises to take care of her. While staying at the castle, Terra learns of Edgar's twin brother, Sabine, who traded the throne for his own freedom and hasn't been seen since. Suddenly, 
an envoy from the Empire arrives in Figaro, looking for Terra. Figaro and the Gestalian Empire having an alliance. The envoy is none other than Kafka, who demands Edgar hands Terra over, but Edgar feigns ignorance. Locke tells Terra that Figaro's alliance with the Empire is just for show, and that he and Edgar are part of the Returners. Without warning, Kafka sets fire to the castle, forcing Edgar's hand by having him escape with Terra and Locke on a trio of chocobos. Before leaving, however, he orders the castle to burrow down into the desert sand, leaving Kafka deserted in the middle of nowhere. Edgar and Locke take Terra to see Bannon, the leader of the Returners. But before they can reach the Returners' hideout, they must first pass over Mount Colts. There they encounter a martial artist named Vargas, who had recently murdered his father, a martial arts master, out of jealousy. As Vargas attacks them, Edgar's long-lost twin brother, Sabine, suddenly jumps into the fray, Sabine having been the one Vargas' father chose as his successor. Sabine defeats Vargas and joins the others in order to use his powers for the betterment of the world. At the Returner's hideout, the newly formed Forsum meets with Bannon. Upon meeting Terra, Bannon believes her to be the last ray of hope, but Terra is hesitant to join their cause. As Terra weighs her options, a member of the Returners stumbles into the hideout, bearing the news that the Empire has discovered their base of operations. Locke volunteers to sneak into South Figaro, a town currently occupied by the Empire, in the hope of stalling their advance. Meanwhile, Bannon, Terra, Edgar and Sabine make their way to Narsha, in the hope that Terra can somehow communicate with the frozen Esper. The four of them ride on a raft down the Lette River, but the voyage is interrupted by Ultros, a chatty octopus with hostile intentions. The battle resulting in Sabine getting separated from the group and washing down another part of the river. As Locke tries to sneak out of South Figaro, he discovers an Imperial General named Celeste, who is turned traitor to the Empire. Locke rescues Celeste, and together they journey north to Narsha. Meanwhile, Sabine washes ashore north of the Kingdom of Doma, and together with a ninja mercenary named Shadow, Sabine infiltrates an Imperial camp as the Empire attacks Doma Castle, under General Leo Kristoff's command. Inside the castle, Cyan, retainer to the King of Doma, hatches a plan to fell the leader of the assault force in the hope of turning the tide of the battle, successfully winning them a temporary reprieve. Afterwards, General Liu refuses to attack the castle head-on, since he doesn't want to sacrifice any lives unnecessarily. But as the general is called away, Kafka grabs the opportunity to poison the river, Doma's only supply of water. As a result, the people of Doma Castle turn fatally ill, Cyan's family tragically being among the diseased, even though he himself survives. In his rage and despair, Cyan attacks the nearby Imperial camp alone, but is unable to catch Kafka. Instead, he meets Sabine and Shadow, and after Sabine has talked Cyan out of his one-man suicide mission, the three of them make for Nasha, vengeance against the Empire having to wait another day. Together, they escape aboard the ghostly Phantom Train, which ferries the dead from the world of the living to the other side. They manage to escape the train before it takes them to the afterlife, but as the train continues on, Cyan witnesses those who died at Doma, including his wife and child, who manage to say their goodbyes. After the party escapes the train, Shadow takes his leave, as Sabine and Cyan leap down Baron Falls to the town of Moblis. On the nearby veldt, a vast plain filled with beasts, they befriend a feral child named Gao, who shows them the way to a diving helmet. 
using the device to brave the currents of the Serpent Trench, Sabine, Cyan and Gao reach the city of Nike, where they board a ferry bound for South Figaro, so that they may rendezvous with Sabine's companions at Nasha. Terra, Bannon and Edgar arrive at Nasha and rendezvous with Avis. The four urge the Elder of Nasha to join the side of the Eternus' resistance, arguing that the Esper in the nearby mines will continue to draw hostile Imperial attention. The others arrive, and Celes informs those assembled that the Empire is already marching on Nasha. The Returners hurry into the mountain to defend the Esper's resting place as Kafka leads an attack to claim the creature for the Empire. Defeating the Imperial forces, the Returners save the town. However, Kafka escapes. The heroes approach the Esper at its current location on the cliffs above Nasha, but it again reacts to Terra's presence with an outpouring of energy. Terra transforms into a glowing pink monster, levitating into the air with a piercing scream. Terra flies away, leaving the rest of the party behind bewildered by her sudden metamorphosis as she soars through the sky. Several of the Returners remain to protect Nasha, while a search party heads to the west to find Terra, using Figaro Castle to burrow under the mountains to Kolingen. They continue south to Jador and then to Zozo, a town of thieves. Atop the highest building, the group finds a transformed Terra under the care of the Esper Ramu, who tells the party about the War of the Magi and the Imperial invasion of their realm, and that he called Terra to him to put her to rest when her powers awoke. Ramu had escaped the Empire with three comrades who fell during the escape and turned to Magis' site. Ramu says the Empire's methods of forcibly extracting magic from Espers results in a weaker form of magic. But when an Esper dies and crystallizes into Magisite, their abilities can be transferred in full. Terra needs to accept her powers, but Ramu urges the party to rescue the other Espers in the Imperial capital and turns himself into Magisite, entrusting the Returners with his power and the power of his friends to fight the Empire. Celes leads the expedition to the Empire with Locke and two others accompanying her. As no boats go to the southern continent, however, the group returns to Jidor. At the Opera House south of Jidor, they meet the Impresario, who worries Cesar Gabriani, the wandering gambler, will abduct Maria, the star of the opera Maria and Draco. Since Celes bears an uncanny resemblance to Maria, Locke hatches a plan for her to take Maria's place in the opera as a ploy to gain access to Setzer's airship, the Blackjack, the only private airship in the world. Ultros overhears the plan and during the performance attempts to drop a weight on Celeste. Locke and the others stop him, but the show is ruined, and in the commotion, Setzer abducts Celeste. Celeste then helps Locke and the others sneak on board the Blackjack, and tricks Setsa into helping them by making a bet using a two-headed coin to beat them at his own game. Setsa flies the group to Albrook, and they set out for the Imperial capital of Vector. Once in the city, they are able to sneak into the Magitech research facility, where Magitech weapons are being manufactured. There, they witness Kafka torturing two espers. Shiva and Ifrit, and overhear him declaring he will revive the warring triad. Believing himself to have no more use for them, Kafka discards Shiva and Ifrit as if they were nothing. Once the party finds the Espers, however, they entrust their magicide to the group, much like Ramu had done before them, bestowing them with their true power. Afterwards, the party continues through the facility and releases several espers being drained of their power. As the espers turn to Magisite, Dr. Sid, the chief scientist of the Gestalian Empire and the creator of Magitech, arrives on the scene. 
finally understanding that the true power of espers can only be transferred upon their death through magicite. Upon seeing Celeste, Sid asks her whether the rumors of her infiltrating the Returners as a spy were true. Before she can get a word in, however, Kefka appears and confirms the rumors of her working as an undercover agent for the Empire to be true. Kafka orders Celeste to bring him the Magicite. But as he orders the rest of the party to be killed, Celeste disobeys him, teleporting herself and the Gestalian forces away to keep Locke and the others safe. As the facility threatens to self-destruct due to the Esper's containment cells having been broken, Sid helps the party escape and shows regret for having experimented on the Esper's. He tells them he's going to talk to the Emperor to explain the folly of his way. As Kafka approaches, Sid pushes the party into a minecart to get them to safety. Having escaped, the party meets up with Setzer and returns to Soso, destroying two cranes Kafka uses to try to destroy the Blackjack. In Zozo, one of the pieces of magicite the party acquired from the Magitech research facility is revealed to be that of Tara's father, Maduin, who restores her memories. Tara explains she is half human and half Esper, born from a human named Madelin, who had entered the Esper realm and befriended Maduin. When the Empire attacked two years later, Tara and her parents were swept up and sent to the human world, along with the forces of the Gestalian Empire. Having discovered a human and Esper hybrid in Terra, Emperor Gestal took Terra along with Maduin and raised her as a magitech experiment due to her natural magic powers. Now accepting who she is, Terra and the party return to Narsha and tell the others of their plan to attack the Empire using the machinery of Figaro and the resources of Narsh. Realizing they lack manpower, they decide to open the gate to the Esper world and ask for their help. Terra are possibly being able to breach the gap between humans and Espers, proving the two races can coexist peacefully. As Terra begins to call out to the Espers at the gate to the Esper world, Kefka appears, informing them it was the Empire's wish all along for Terra to open the gate. As Kefka confronts the party, Terra's cries open the gate, and Espers rush out, decimating Vector and crashing the Blackjack. In the aftermath, Emperor Gestal tells the party the Espers' terrifying power has made him realize the error of his ways. He declares a truce and asks the Returners and Terra to help him locate the Espers that fled the gate and make them understand the war is over. Having made peace, Terra and Locke accompany General Liu to Crescent Island to track down the Espers. To assist their efforts, Liu has hired Shadow, the mercenary. On the way to Crescent Island, Terra and General Liu have a heart-to-heart, -heart, and the General apologizes for not having saved her from being used as a weapon. Terra fears she is too different, and asks the General whether he believes she will ever experience love. The general consoles her before taking his leave. Shadow suddenly appearing on the deck, having overheard the conversation by accident. He tells Sarah that he can't help her, and that she must find the answers for herself. Locke, on the other hand, is fighting his own battle against seasickness. Having arrived at Crescent Island, a place rumored to still be home to magic, Terra, Locke, and Shadow split from the Empire and discover the backwater town of Thamasa. There they meet Strago, who feigns having no knowledge of espers or magic. They also meet Realm, his granddaughter, who quickly befriends Shadow's dog, Interceptor. As the party rests up, Realm is trapped in a burning building, and the townspeople reveal they can use magic when they try to put the fire out. But the fire proves to be too strong, even for their magic. Terra, Locke and Strago 
enter the building to save Rel, but end up being rescued themselves by Shandu, who has come to get his dog, Interceptor, that had followed them inside. Strago explains, Thamasa was founded by magic-imbued humans who sought to live normal lives after the War of the Magi. As their descendants, the town folks have inherited some magical powers. Strago agrees to help Terra and Locke locate the Espers as thanks for saving Realm. But even though Realm wishes to help too, Strago won't allow it. As the others join up with Strago, Shadow leaves to find the Espers on his own with Interceptor. At the Esper Caves, a third run-in with everyone's favorite octopus, Ultros, prompts Realm to intervene and save the party with her ability to sketch living portraits of monsters, forcing Ultros to face himself. Afterwards, Strago agrees to let her join them. Deep in the caves, the group finds the Espers, led by the Esper Yura, who is apologetic about the destruction of Vector as the Espers lost control of their powers when passing through the gate between realms. Locke tells Yura that the Empire wants to make peace with the Espers, and back in Thamasa, General Leo and Yura reach a truce. The truce is short-lived, however, as Kefka arrives and kills the Espers, taking their magicide shards and knocking out the party, claiming he is acting under the Emperor's orders. When Leo tries to stop him, Kefka kills him as well. Suddenly, the gate to the Esper world flies open, and several Espers race to attack Kefka, but he destroys them and adds their magicide shards to his collection before departing. After the battle, Terra and the others grieve the loss of General Leo and bury him in Thamasa. Alerted to the Empire's treachery, Setsa and the other Returners, sans Banon, arrive at Thamasa in the Blackjack. Kefka and Emperor Gestahl, however, enter the Esper Realm in order to find the remains of the Warring Triad, the origin of all magic, and use their power to raise the floating continent. Strago tells them that each statue of the Warring Triad holds the others in check, and that if they were to be moved out of alignment, the resulting imbalance in power would have catastrophic consequences. The Returners board the floating continent, fighting the Imperial Air Force, as well as Ultras and his friend, Mr. Typhoon. They find Shadow, who had kept working for the Empire until they tried to kill him. After a battle with the legendary Ultima weapon, Shadow departs as the Returners confront Kafka and Gestahl in the presence of the Warring Triad. Celes arrives on the scene, and Gestahl and Kafka urge her to return to their side and kill her friends, so that the three of them can rule the world together. Much to their surprise, Celes refuses and stabs Kafka. Furious and distraught, Kafka attempts to awaken the Triad, but Emperor Gestahl, knowing this would lead to disaster, tries to stop him. A wounded Kefka then kicks Gestahl off the floating continent to his doom and moves the statues out of alignment. Celes warns him that the Triad's power will go haywire, but Kefka laughs it off. As things keep taking a turn for the worse, Shadow reappears, and with his assistance, the party is able to escape back to the Blackjack. Having failed to stop Kefka, the Warring Triad's magical field has nevertheless been destabilized, radically shifting the face of the planet. The Blackjack is destroyed in the ensuing chaos, and the party is scattered around the world. A year passes, during which Kefka raises a tower of ruins over the former Vector and drains the Warring Triad of their power, becoming the god of magic. The New World, born from the destruction of the Old One, is a dying one, where many plants and animals are mutated from the magical fallout, and cities have been decimated by Kafka's Light of Judgment, a beam of energy he uses to strike down anyone who opposes his rule. Celeste awakens on a small island with Sid, who tells her 
of the sorriest state of the world. As Sid becomes ill, Celeste does her best to take care of him, paying him back for having taken care of her all this time. Ultimately, her efforts amount to naught, as Sid does not survive. Finding herself alone in the world, Celeste throws herself off the cliff to the north, hoping to end it all. But as she washes back onto the shore, she discovers a bird who's had its wound wrapped with a familiar bandana, giving Celeste cause to believe Locke might still be alive. In order to find him, Celeste returns to the mainland and is reunited with Sabine in Sen. Confident the others have survived as well, they continue their search together. In Mobley's, the group finds Terra taking care of the village children after their parents perished in the apocalypse. While in the village, Terra has experienced love in a way she never had before, so she refuses to leave the children or show them her true form. Celeste and Sabine continue to Nicaea and find a man who resembles Edgar, named Gerard, leading a band of thieves. They follow him on a ship to South Figaro and into a cave leading to the buried Figaro castle. Once there, Edgar reveals he ingeniously used the alias Gerard to trick the thieves into helping him reclaim Figaro, since it was lost under the sand. In Colingen, the three find Setzer, who shows them the tomb of his friend Daryl, who owned an airship, the Falcon. Together, they recover the Falcon, and the group travels the world, discovering many long-lost secrets of the War of the Magi, unearthed by the destruction of the world. The group finds Cyan living on top of Mount Sozo, where he carries on a long-distance romance with a young woman called Lola, who believes him to be her dead boyfriend. Strago, believing Realm is dead, has joined the cult of Kafka, while Realm is a painter working in Jodor for Auser, the richest man in town. Locke, seeking a way to revive his dead lover Rachel, enters the Phoenix Cave to find the magicite of the Esper Phoenix. However, even after he is successful, it only revives Rachel for a moment just long enough for Locke to come to terms with his guilt for failing to save her. Gao has returned to his home on the Veldt and is willing to join the party once more. As they revisit Terra, the town is attacked, forcing her to get back in touch with her powers. Much to her surprise, however, the children accept her, even in her Esper form, so she joins the fight against Kafka in the hope of making the world a better place for all of them. With their ranks reassembled, the Returners attack Kafka's tower, knowing that if they destroy the Warring Triad, magic will vanish from the world, leading them to wonder what will happen to Terra. At the summit, Kafka tells the party mortal lives are without meaning or significance, as ultimately everything people build is destroyed, and nothing they do truly impacts the world. The party tells Kafka, the bonding over day-to-day -day struggles gives the people the will to live on in spite of the hardships. Kafka turns the light of judgment on the world before attacking the party. Upon confronting Kafka as the god of magic, he exclaims he'll destroy all dreams and hope before breaking down into hysterical laughter. Kafka is killed, and with him, the essence of magic vanishes. The Esper's magicite remains dissolved, but Mandarin tells Terra she can endure as a human if she has a strong emotional attachment to something in the world. With the last of her power, Terra leads the group out of the tower aboard the Falcon. She falls onto the main deck, and after regaining consciousness, finds herself fully human, due to her love for the children of Mobius. The party flies across the world and witnesses the city's rebuilding. Terra steps to the bow of the Falcon and releases her ponytail to the wind, finally free to live and enjoy her life as she wishes. <laughs> Thanks for watching. I hope you liked the video. 
We had a lot of fun making it. And personally, I had a blast playing Final Fantasy VI for the first time. If you're still here at this point, then make sure to subscribe. Bird sounds. Caw -caw!